Heavenly Father, this morning, I would imagine that someone here today is asking you for a mighty work. Father, maybe the mighty work is a child, a parent, a friend in need of salvation. Father, maybe the mighty work is a job. Maybe the mighty work is a healing touch. Father, we know that in Nazareth, Your Son could do no mighty works except heal a few people because of a lack of faith. Father, we look out at our nation. We look at our church. Father, we look at our families. And we see the need for a mighty work. Lord, today, it is my prayer that as we open our Bibles, that the Spirit of the living God will move amongst us. And we will understand, Father, that this very well could be a day of preparation. Father, we will discover today that people recognized Jesus. They ran to Jesus. They brought their friends to Jesus. They begged Jesus. But that doesn't seem to be our day. But Father, that day may be coming sooner than we realize. And so I pray in this time of preparation that You will enable us to become a people of great faith. Trusting God that you can and will do a great work here through our faith. Now, Father, it's my prayer that you'll open our hearts and that you'll open our minds as we open our Bibles. And I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I wanted to tell you a few moments about Carl. Carl was six foot two inches tall, 240 pounds. He was a Texan from San Antonio, Texas. Carl was a veteran of the U.S. Navy. He was an avid outdoorsman. And he loved taking outdoor photography. So at the age of 24, Carl moved from San Antonio, Texas to Anchorage, Alaska. At age 30, he took a great adventure. He spent five months in the Brooks Mountain Ranges, camping by himself out in the wild, taking pictures of wildlife photography. Carl, at two foot, or I'm sorry, at six foot, two inches tall, 240 pounds, was a man who loved adventure. The disciples, We're in quite an adventure. If you recall, just the night before, our text begins this morning in chapter 6, verse 3, but the night before our story begins, the disciples were with 5,000 men. And the Lord Jesus fed 5,000 men, plus women, plus children, with five loaves of bread and two small fish. Then Jesus noticed in His disciples that their hearts had become hard. And so He sent them out on the lake to cross the Sea of Galilee. And they spent nine long hours toiling and rowing because God wanted them to know that they needed to invite Him into their lives. Now today, the disciples will be on another adventure. And their adventure today begins in Mark chapter 6, verse 53, where the Bible says, when they had crossed over. The night before they were on the lake, they crossed over the lake. And today, I wanted you to think about something. I wanted you to think that at some point in time, all of us, are going to cross over from life to death. Now, the disciples crossed over. All of us will cross over. 
And when we cross over, a wise person will have made sure that when they cross over, they are ready to meet God. Carl was quite an adventurer. And because he was an adventurer and because he was getting ready to cross over into another adventure, he began his preparation for another five months out in the Alaska wilderness. Today, I want you to see that when the disciples crossed over, the Bible says that they recognized Jesus. Take a look at Mark chapter 6, verse 53 and 54. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret, and they anchored there. And as soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. Now, the Bible says as soon as the disciples crossed over, As soon as they crossed over the Sea of Galilee from their night of toiling and rowing, their nine hours on the lake in the storm, the Bible says the people recognized Jesus. They recognized Jesus as a miracle worker. Now, throughout our time in the Gospel of Mark, different people have looked at Jesus and they have recognized Him maybe as a miracle worker, but they did not recognize Him as the Son of God. For example, do you remember in Cursa, when Jesus had gone into Cursa, into the land of the Gadareans, there was a man who was demon-possessed. And Jesus healed that demon-possessed man, but the people of Cursa saw Jesus as an obstacle to what they wanted. They wanted to make money, and so they said to Jesus, please leave our community. They recognized in Jesus a miracle worker, but an obstacle to what they wanted to accomplish. Jesus was in Nazareth. And they recognized Jesus as the village carpenter. They saw Him not as the Son of God, just an ordinary man. Jesus, we know, spoke and touched the life of King Herod. But Herod recognized Jesus Yes, as a miracle worker, but a man who stood in his way, an obstacle, if you will, because Herod had a passion. He was pursuing his brother's wife, and Jesus and John the Baptist were getting in the way. So people recognize Jesus. They recognize Him as an obstacle to what they want to achieve. They recognize Him as an ordinary man. But the disciples, when they had crossed over in the midst of the storm, they invited Jesus into the boat. And we learned last week in Matthew chapter 14 that they recognized Jesus as the Son of God and they bowed down and they worshipped Him. Well, there's a wasp. Let's hope that nobody gets stung by it. But now, later, sometime in the next year, Because Jesus is a year from Calvary, sometime the disciples are going to be asked by Jesus, who do you say that I am? And here's what the Bible says in Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say that you're John the Baptist, others say that you're Elijah, Still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. I wonder today who you would say that Jesus is. Is he an obstacle in your way to pursue what you're trying to pursue? Do you see Jesus as an obstacle? Do you see Jesus as an ordinary man, a good man, a prophet? but just an ordinary man. Is that how you see Jesus? Or do you see Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God? Do you see Jesus as the One who came to die on the cross for your sins? Because the Bible says we're all sinners. Romans 3.23 The Bible says the wages of our sin is death. And the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you see Jesus as the one who died on the cross for your sins. The Christ. That's what Peter said. That's what the disciples recognized Jesus as. 
Do you see Jesus as the one who you could invite into your boatload of troubles like we talked about last week? Do you see Jesus as the one who you could invite into your boatload of troubles and Jesus can take those troubles and make everything all right? Is that how you see Jesus today? Because they recognized Jesus. Now, just as the people recognized Jesus, Carl, six foot, two inches tall, 240 pound Texan from San Antonio that moved to Anchorage, Alaska, Carl recognized that on his next adventure, he had to be prepared. You see, the United States Navy taught Carl to be prepared. Carl learned to be prepared because he had spent five months on the Brooks Mountain Range all by himself. Carl learned to be prepared his last six years living in Alaska. And so Carl was getting prepared. He recognized his need to prepare for his next five-month adventure. Carl was going to be flown 225 miles north of Anchorage, Alaska, dropped off, and spend five months by himself. And so his preparation included 500 rolls of film, 1,400 pounds of food, two rifles, a shotgun, and ammunition. He also left behind three maps that he gave to friends and relatives saying where he would be. With all of that preparation, recognizing his need to prepare, Carl hired a bush pilot that flew him 225 miles north of Anchorage, Alaska, and dropped him off in March of 1980. Now, the Bible tells us that the disciples crossed over. They crossed over. Everybody recognized them. And then the Bible says the people ran. Look at verse 55, if you would. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats wherever they heard he was. You see that phrase, they ran? It's an interesting phrase. It means they ran about. It's only found here in the New Testament. It's the only place where you find people running about, running here, running there. And the Bible says when they recognized who Jesus was, when they recognized that He, Jesus, the miracle worker, was there, they ran about. Wherever Jesus was, they ran to Him. Now, I wonder today if you have a need maybe to run to Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30, Come to Me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I wonder if you have a need today and if you would run to Jesus. We have a special prayer service in our church at 201 where we invite you to come to run to Jesus, to bow your heads and to pray with us and to give your burdens to the Lord Jesus. The Bible says they recognized Jesus, they ran to Jesus, and now the Bible says they placed. Look at verse 56. The Bible says, and wherever he went, into villages, towns, or the countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. So, here are the people, and they recognize Jesus, and so they find the sick, and they place them on mats. Verse 55 said they carried them to Jesus. They placed them, they carried them, they took the sick, and they ran carrying the sick on mats to the Lord Jesus. Now, if you have your Bibles, in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, the Bible says, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call the sinners. And I've thought about that. Here we have a wonderful picture. The disciples and Jesus have crossed over. And as soon as they land, as soon as they anchor, people recognize Jesus is here. 
And when they recognize that Jesus is there, the miracle worker, they put the sick on mats and they run to wherever Jesus is. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us they ran to the villages. They ran to the cities. They ran to the towns. Wherever Jesus was, they ran, they ran, they ran. And they put the sick in the marketplaces. The King James Version has streets. It's the marketplace where the social hub of the city. They ran and they placed the sick there where Jesus was. You know, and I thought about that. And I thought, well, today, people in America are not running to Jesus. People in America are not bringing the sick to Jesus. And so I ask myself, why? What has happened in the last 2,000 years? Why is it that people are not running to Jesus? Why are they not bringing the sick to Jesus? And I'd like to suggest a couple of thoughts this morning. Number one is simply this. Our sickness that we heal in church is a sickness of sin. The Bible says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says as many as received Him, to them gives He the authority to become the children of God. You see, we deal with a specific sickness, don't we? It is a sickness called sin. And you believe and I believe that our national problem and our problem of our neighbors is primarily a sin sickness. Sin has affected us all. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things are become new. So you believe and I believe that the problems of our nation and the problem of our neighbors is that they are sinners and they need a Savior. You believe that and I believe that. But you know, that is not what our nation believes anymore. Our nation believes not in sin sickness, but our nation believes in choice. Americans want choice. And we don't have choice, do we? We say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We do not believe that there are choices to have a right relationship with God. There's one way, and that's Jesus. Americans want choice. We offer Jesus. Americans want tolerance. And we're not tolerant, are we? We are loving, we are gracious, we are merciful, and we are forgiving. But are we tolerant? No. We believe that the Bible is truth, and we believe there is right, and we believe that there is wrong. And Americans want religion without righteousness. But we believe that the Bible teaches righteousness. And righteousness comes when a sinner realizes they're a sinner, they need a Savior, they become a Christian, and they become righteous through the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, why is it that people are not running to church today? Why are they not bringing the sick to church? Because America has gone through a cultural change. And that cultural change is Americans want choice and we say Jesus is the way. Americans want tolerance and we say the Bible is truth. Americans want religion and we offer righteousness through Jesus Christ. But there are still people in crisis. And what did... Jesus do. He went to the marketplace, to the villages, not Florida, the villages, the towns, the agricultural fields. He went to the where the people were, 
And the people who were sick were healed. You see, one of the reasons I love our church is because our goal as an Acts 1A church is to go where the people are. And so as people are in crisis, for example... A few weeks ago, your missionaries, Bob and Sandra Jackson, who are gone to Virginia Tech, had the opportunity to minister to Chinese students because there was a crisis, a dorm fire. And because Bob and Sandra were there, because there was a crisis, they could minister to the Chinese students, and now they are coming to Bob and Sandra's Bible study. You see, as a church, we look at where there are people, and people in particular in crisis, like the shoebox ministry, or the good news jail and prison ministry, or abortion alternatives, and we minister where people are in crisis. And that is what happened. The people in crisis went to Jesus. People are not flocking to churches today. They're not running to church. And they're not running to church because they want choice and we offer Jesus. They want tolerance and we offer mercy, grace, forgiveness, yes. But we say the Bible is true. They want religion. We're teaching righteousness. But out and about, there are still people in crisis. And if we have ministries in these times of places of crisis, then we can touch the people in the street, the village, the countryside, the marketplace, where they are. Carl was 225 miles north of Fairbanks, Alaska. Out all by himself. He went in March. And he had supplies until the end of July. He was to be picked up the end of July, the 1st of August. He was so confident in the end of his expedition that he got rid of all of his extra ammunition because he knew he would not need it. But August came and no pilot picked him up. September came and no pilot picked him up. October came and no pilot picked him up. 225 miles north of Fairbanks, Alaska, no one came in August. Nobody came in September and nobody came in October. But Carl knew, he absolutely knew, that his father, his relatives, his friends, somebody would send out a search party just like the people put their sick friends on a mat and ran to where Jesus was. Carl knew that somebody who loved him would find a way to rescue him. The final truth I wanted to share with you this morning is this. They recognized, they ran, they placed, but they also begged. Here's what the Bible says. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of the cloak, and all who touched him were healed. They begged him. Jesus is walking through the villages, walking through the marketplace, walking through the towns, and they begged him, they begged him. And the Bible says, all that touched him were healed. Now, I believe that the Bible teaches that God is drawn to desperation. If you took your Bibles and you went with me to Matthew chapter 14, here's what you would read. Verse 25. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear. This is the night before. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it's I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. 
But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Now, this story of Peter walking on the water was not told by Mark. And who knows why the Holy Spirit had Mark not tell it. But Matthew wants us to know that when Jesus walked on the water, He said to Peter, come on, Peter, you walk too. And the Bible says that Peter was walking, but he looked, took his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink. He said, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out His hand and saved him. Now listen, Peter was in a time of crisis. And in his time of crisis, Jesus reached out and saved him. You know, people are not running to the church today. They're not running to Jesus. Our nation isn't running to Jesus. We're not placing the sick on the mats to Jesus. But you know, there will come a day of crisis, won't there? And I don't know when that day of crisis will be. It might be that our nation will collapse under its financial debt. I don't know. I'm not an economist. But it might happen. It might be that our nation will implode internally because of our immorality. I don't know. But I do believe that there will come a time of great crisis in our nation. And in that time of great crisis, people will be begging for help. And that is when you and I need to be ready. For when they are begging, we need to have the answer. I don't know if you believe with me that there will come that time. But I do. And that's why I'm so grateful that yesterday a group of folks in our church prepared themselves for future disaster. We now have a disaster relief team in our church. And we have people prepared if there's a disaster to go across the street or across the nation. We are now a ready church. The federal government, FEMA, now we'll recognize our church as a place. If there's a disaster, people can come here. We're ready for those times of disaster. A young girl comes to us and she's pregnant. She has nowhere to go. We're ready. Because of our linkage with the Liberty Godparent Home, we can say to any young lady who's contemplating an abortion, we will drive you three and a half hours north. There's a place where you can live. It will cost you absolutely nothing. And you can keep that baby and you can either keep your child or put that child up for adoption. We're ready. You see, the fact of the matter is there's coming a time of crisis and we need to be ready. And I see this as a time of preparation where you and I prepare theologically for the great crisis that's coming to our nation. You say, you know, Pastor, we're a bunch of amateurs. What would we know about dealing with crisis? I want you to think about something. For 120 years, Noah built an ark. Noah prepared for 120 years. And as far as I know, everybody around him, his neighbors and everybody else, laughed at him, mocked him, ridiculed him. Just like people do you and me. Oh, you're not tolerant enough. Oh, you believe that Jesus is the only way. Oh my gosh, you believe the Bible. But you know, then that crisis comes. When that crisis came, I bet every one of Noah's neighbors wished they were in that ark. And the crisis will come. You say, Pastor, we're just a bunch of amateurs. What do we know? We know the Bible. We know God's Word. Let me let you think about this. Noah was an amateur and he built a boat. Professionals built the Titanic. Which, which of the two would you prefer to be on? 
The fact of the matter is, this is a time of preparation. Preparation for you and for me to get ready for when the great crisis come and people come to the church in droves and they're begging for help. Carl was in a time of crisis. There's no doubt about it. Nobody came in August. Nobody came in September. Nobody came in October. Nobody came in November. Nobody came in December. Carl had no supplies. He had thrown out his ammunition. He was 225 miles away. In January, in January, his family said, don't you think Carl should be home by now? In January. In January, they called the Alaska State Troopers and said, you know, we've got this map. Uh, Could you go look for Carl? They found Carl February the 2nd, 1981. He was frozen to death. Frozen to death. They found his film. They found his camera. They found his two rifles. They found his shotgun. And they found his 100-page diary. And in his diary, here's what Carl wrote. Quote, I think I should have used more foresight about arranging my departure. Carl was a great planner. He took his 1,400 pounds of food, his ammunition, his camera, his 500 rolls of film, but Carl forgot one thing. Carl never hired the bush pilot to come back and get him. He was a great planner. He was really prepared, except for one Fatal mistake. I think I should have used more foresight about arranging my departure. Remember the disciples crossed over. And one day you and I are going to cross over. And when it comes time for your departure, I wonder if you're going to be ready. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 20 verse 7, Some trust in chariots and some in horses but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. May I ask you a question this morning? Are you trusting in Christ as your Savior? Do you realize and do you believe that we are all sick with sin? There's only one solution to sin, and that's the Lord Jesus. And I'm asking you this morning if you're ready to cross over into life eternal. And then I'm asking you, if God today, if you're a Christian, God is calling you to serve. And I'm asking you if you would trust Him that His calling to serve will be accompanied by His enabling to serve. So will you trust Him today for salvation? And would you trust Him today for service? And finally today, let me just ask you these three questions. As you look out today, the Bible says they crossed over. The Bible says they got out of the boat. The Bible says they carried the sick. I'm asking you, as you look out, do you not see somebody that is not ready to cross over? Do you not see somebody that maybe you need to get out of the boat and go invite them to church? Do you not know somebody that is sin sick? hasn't healing in Jesus, and they need to be carried to church. Easter is coming. And there's no better time to invite somebody than Easter. Will you carry somebody to church? Will you cross out of the comfort zone and invite them to church? As you look out, I'm going to ask you if you'll do that. But then I'm going to ask you if you'll look up. And when you look up, the Bible says He touched all. Or He healed all who touched Him. I'm wondering today, don't you know somebody that needs healing? Couldn't you begin today praying and saying, Oh God, so-and-so is lost and they're going to die and spend eternity in hell. I need you to touch them. 
Would you begin praying for them today as well as inviting them Easter Sunday? And then finally today, I'm going to ask you if you would look in. And when you look in today, let me ask you, who do you recognize Jesus to be? Is Jesus the obstacle between you and your goals? Is Jesus just an ordinary person? Or is He the Christ, the Son of the living God, And would you look in and would you say, oh God, what would you have me to do in service to you? Carl, with all of his planning, forgot to hire the pilot to pick him up. Are you ready today? Are you ready to cross over from this life into life eternal? Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus and thank you for the gift of eternal life. Now, Father, today, it is my prayer that if there is someone here who is not a Christian, that today they will be brought to salvation. And, Father, if we are all Christians here today, surely, God, you're calling us to serve you. And I'm wondering today if somebody wouldn't be willing to take that bulletin insert and say, Pastor, God's calling me to serve in this area, in this capacity. Oh God, today, we know that the world is not running to the church. They're not running to Jesus. The world wants choice, we offer Jesus. The world wants tolerance, we offer truth. The world wants religion. We're offering righteousness through Jesus. Father, today is a day of preparation for the day when they will come and they'll beg. And I pray, God, right now, as we are preparing, maybe you're calling somebody here to be a Bible fellowship teacher, calling somebody to serve on a team, calling somebody to serve in some area like the folks yesterday who trained for disaster. God, I pray that we will look up and say, God, I'll serve you wherever you want me to be. Thank you for Jesus. Draw us now to yourself. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you stand and would you come? Just as I am, without one plea, would you come? Just as I am, without one plea,